And I, I'm Tor Eklund. I'm an attorney in the United States. I represent uh, one of the attorneys representing Matt DeHart. Uh, we're up in Canada at uh, Paul Ian DeHart's uh, place where they're currently staying. They uh, had to flee to Canada seeking uh, refugee status uh, with the Canadian government because the United States government, uh, through the FBI, uh, tortured their son um, and uh, basically put him up on uh, false, uh, what we consider to be false uh, federal criminal charges in a case down in Tennessee. Matt, when he came up here, was free and had on bond, but um, because of kind of ludicrous technicality, uh, he was uh, thrown in jail. And basically what happened, Paul, if I understand it correctly, is he had informed the authorities in Canada that they had were changing rooms. We're in a college dorm room right now. Uh, that 413 is the room that they originally were in. And uh, basically what happened, we gotta let somebody buy here with laundry. You can see it is a dorm. Uh, basically what happened is they uh, moved upstairs. The, if I remember correctly, Paul, the authorities, they were closed on that Friday, Correct. right? Because it was a holiday. They'd been informed by email and what happened is the authorities got upset because they actually went up one floor uh, in this dorm room building. The address hasn't changed uh, because there was a requirement that they be notified in person. And that, because that minor technicality was violated, Matt DeHart is now in a maximum security prison in Canada. Do I have that right? Correct, yeah. So what we're going to do now is here's the room that they originally were in. We're now going to go walk up the stairs and show you uh, where they are now and the distance between here and when we're walking and the fact that the Canadian authorities weren't told in person even though they were informed via email and tons of other people do these kinds of things all the time they get a slap on the wrist and they go don't get thrown in jail distance from here and there is why Matt DeHart is now in a maximum security prison in Canada shall we absolutely So we're now at room 509, which is where they moved to. They actually were required to move, right? Right. But because the, the, the college said you need, you need to move. Right. The, like we said, the Canadian authorities were informed. We're actually in the same building. You can see we went up one floor. It's the same mailing address. But because Matt moved, they had to move on that Friday. Uh, like we said, the authorities were informed, right? But they were closed so you couldn't inform them in person because of that Matt's now in a maximum security prison in, in Canada and for violating his bond conditions and you guys also had to forfeit what ten thousand yeah. dollars so that's a ten thousand dollar technicality that ended Matt up in a maximum security prison yeah. that's just one part of this Byzantine Kafka-esque nightmare that is this case So Paul, that notice right there is just like the notice that you got saying you had to move out of your dorm room, right? Correct, yeah. And when did you get that? We got it on Good Friday of Easter weekend, and uh, it said that we had to move by um, 8 p.m. on Tuesday. We could start moving from 3 to 8 p.m. the Tuesday following. And so uh, the CBSA office was closed Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday, and we had to move on Tuesday. 
Oh, I see. But then yeah. you gave them notice as soon as you got it via right. email, right? Right. We, we get they, they knew on Friday via right. email, right? Right. But there was no way that you could go in there and see them in person, no. which was a requirement. Right. And, but you had to move on that Tuesday. Correct. Yeah. And yeah. it's the same mailing address. Exactly. We're yeah. in the same building. Yep. Yeah. And we've just got up one floor. Exactly. Right. Yeah. But then they threw your son in jail because of it. Yes, they did. And then they took ten thousand dollars from you because of it. They did. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So. This is our current unit, and all the units are identical. And so I'll show you where Matt's room was in relation to ours. He had the left-hand side room, right where this pencil sharpener is, is where his RFID monitor box was. It had a motion sensor. It was by Recovery Science Corporation. Uh, of Ontario. I'm oh, sorry, well, RFID monitor, does that mean that they were just tracking him by GPS the entire time? Yeah, well, when he was in range of it, it uh -huh. wasn't it wasn't giving real-time GPS. Uh -huh. It would ping it every now and then. I don't know how often that right. was. Those details they didn't tell us. But if he went outside into the hallway, it would notify them immediately, and then he would be start, start to be live uh, or uh, GPS tracking. So they could follow him live wherever he went. So they were tracking him yes. on top of knowing Yes. Where he was here. Correct. So if even if he had moved some other place, they right. would have had GPS monitoring. Right. Or... They would have known exactly where he was. Right. So that day, um, uh, uh, Steve Tan from Recovery Science Corporation had to come and actually move the box. We we didn't want Matt to move without the box being moved because it would trigger an alert. And so um, we told him it, we set up for him to come. He couldn't get here till I think it's six o'clock, and so he came, uh, moved the box. Because if you disturbed it, then it would set off an alarm that you were trying to tamper with it. It had a, a motion sensor. Uh, and then he came, we moved the box, and then Matt moved upstairs. Um, and then uh, the, we, got, we got everything done. I mean, Tuesday we were just moving. I, I don't know how many trips I made back and forth. And Tuesday we went to sleep. Wednesday morning, um, 10 o'clock, I think, the police came knocking at the door. Uh, five Toronto police officers and a CBSA enforcement officer. We looked through the people, and there they were. In the, in the hallway to come in to violate Matt. And all they knew was a, it was a bond violation. They didn't know what it was about. They didn't know specifically why, at least the police officers didn't. They said, we're, we're just here to arrest him for a bond violation. So five of them. Five rather burly Toronto police officers and one female CBSA. Um, when you say CBSA, what is that? Uh, a, a, a Canadian Border Services a, a agency oh, okay. uh, enforcement officer. So with, when she had Toronto police backup, I guess. And I take it he went peacefully. Yes, he did. Yeah, originally they were going to haul him out in the hallway, and then Leanne said no. She she hung on to him and said, you're not taking him out of here. You hung on to him? I yeah, did. She I said, hung on to him, and they actually had to tell me, take your hands off your son. I said, no, I'm not going to take my hands off my son. What I said to him was, the FBI has already done this to him. You're not going to do this to him. And they were the police officers were very nice. Um, they actually had their hands clamped on his, and I said, you cannot do that, he has PTSD. Um, you can't do that. So he, he just, they just made him sit down, and they explained what they were gonna do. And, um, and then he asked, can I, I don't know if he was, get his hoodie or whatever he needed. They let him go in the other room, they took his hoodie and everything. They kept Paul outside there. In the kitchen. In the kitchen, kitchen while I was with Matt. And then they took Matt, and it was, it was not, the CBSA who assured me that she was going to call and that everything would be fine. It was actually one of the local police officers uh, named Stephen who called me up to say Matt went peaceably. He he's he did fine. Don't worry about him. We got him there safely. Everything went okay. Well, you said so, Matt had PTSD. Can I ask you where he got that? Or yeah, from being tortured. That's where he got PTSD. And who tortured him? The FBI tortured him. How and did they he, torture him? You don't want me to start telling you that, do you? So it can get pretty emotional. Um, they did a lot of things to him. They um, they did a lot of things to him. They um, they put him in a dry cell and stripped him naked. They sprayed him with some kind of bleach antiseptic. Um, they let him defecate in a cell. 
they wouldn't feed him unless he talked with them, so they gave him uh, Coke and candy bars. And I didn't know because he didn't want to tell me till much later. I remember when he was in Kentucky, one of the um, inmates who he became friends with had told me once on the phone that Matt had had burn marks when he came in on both sides of his arms. And Matt didn't remember how he got them until he started having nightmares. And his memories started coming back. And they put him in a chair and they put a bag over his head. And they poured water on him and they kept tasing him. And that's why he's got PTSD. And who knows what else they did. I just know that afterwards he said they kept him from eating and they kept him up. Sleep deprivation and loud noise when he'd go to sleep. they bang on the bars and stuff like that. And he said the worst of all this for him was when he thought they weren't ever going to give him anything to drink and he was going to die. And they did this for days. This is what, August 2010? Yeah. And this is in Bangor, Maine, right? This is in Bangor, Maine. Right. And this is the FBI that was doing this, right? Yes. And he still has nightmares, and that's why I have nightmares. Paul has nightmares. And uh, it's funny because when Matt and I talk about it, we have the same. I tell him, you know. I wake up with panic attacks because of what happened to you. So, yeah, that's why he has PTSD. That's my government. I'm really ashamed of them. How can they do that to people? Sorry, guys.